So, hello everybody. Today's vlog is going to be something different. I'm going to touch on something quite close to me at the moment, something that I'm going through. And then we're going to have a little reaction. Uh, so I'm exhausted right now. I don't know if, if I look it or not. I'm absolutely beat. I wore this white hoodie today, which was a freaking mistake because I'm just too tired to look after it and I've gone and stuffed down it. But I don't, I don't know. I don't want to sit here every week and moan about some problem that I'm having. You know, last vlog I was talking about how I was depressed and, you know, I don't, I don't want to make it one of those things because everyone's got their own problems and I'm sure they come here for entertainment not to hear me moaning but this I want to talk about today is an issue that's actually affected me for quite a while it's an issue that on the front end of it just it's hard to gauge I think sometimes because I'm the same you you think this thing is terrifying if it happens to you but it also doesn't appear when you first mention it to be like that big a deal you know like, oh, that's bad. But basically, I've been struggling a lot recently with pretty extreme sleep paralysis. And basically, the dictionary definition of sleep paralysis, I don't know. So I'm going to take it off Wikipedia and put it up on the screen for a minute or a second. Basically, people usually, I think, think of sleep paralysis as something that happens to you when you wake up. I think it's actually where the demon, the succubus in history came from, was people in ancient times or a long time ago before these medical revelations happened would have sleep paralysis and believe it was a demon sitting on their chest or their stomach. I have had sleep paralysis when I wake up. It was actually the first type of sleep paralysis I ever had. It happened right after I read about sleep paralysis <laughs> and then it just seemed to happen. It was back in the days when I used to go out and I used to go party and yeah, I suffered with the after effects of really heavy nights and I started getting sleep paralysis. I'll describe my experience with it. So I'd wake up, but I wouldn't really have woken up. And there's something I noticed about it when I used to have it was in my mind, I knew I was in my room and what I was seeing in front of my eyes was my room but when I look back at it and I can remember the image of the room well I could for a while and it would never actually be my room there would always be something different but my dream state or my dream mind was telling me that this is my room and it always end up having some dark feeling of some entity coming towards me as I slept or was stuck there and I basically couldn't move and I'd try my hardest to move because it'd feel like this dark presence was coming towards you. I've woken up and there'd been an old hag there choking me like a witch but for me I always managed to wake myself up quite quickly in the morning. The, the problem is now I'm having this type of sleep paralysis that is really hard to find anything about online. I know it is because I have now found stuff and I didn't know what it was initially, but it's getting to this extreme level. And I, I don't know if I can talk about this on YouTube without getting into trouble, but I'm like, what the hell? I'm going to do it anyway, because it's pretty horrific. I'm not going to lie. Like it's going me to the point where I'm actually like kind of terrified to go to sleep. <laughs> So last night I was up until like 5 a.m., drifted off for half an hour, and then I kind of forced myself back awake because I was terrified that it might happen, even though I was probably past the point where it normally happens. What will happen? And this ha can happen up to like 16 times a night for me. And it's, I don't know, it, it got better for a while. It was terrible when I quit my job at Spoons for that first two months I was just it was it was happening every single night like 16 times a night so I'd be lying there and I'd suddenly feel like I was falling and it was like this horrible feeling where I just kept feeling like I was flying everywhere and there was tons of pressure on my chest and side and it was just really uncomfortable and I'd realize I couldn't move and I'd force myself to move. Eventually, I'd just try to wiggle my toes and then I'd come back out of it and then I'd go to sleep and it'd happen again. And it stayed like that for a while, which was really, it's not nice. Like it doesn't sound like much, but it was really, really, really distressing for me. But it was livable. 
Like, it didn't make me scared to go to sleep. It was just kind of a, oh, I've got to deal with this so many times before I'm finally going to get to go to sleep. However, it's changed. And in the last, I actually can't remember now, in the last month or so, the, the way it manifests has changed. And as of the last week, it's gone so extreme. And like, I'll explain it. So basically, I'll explain the one from last night. No, last night, the night before. So basically, if you've ever seen The Sopranos, <laughs> there's a character on The Sopranos called Christopher Moltisanti. And I was watching The Sopranos the other night and I, I was like, oh, I'm going to get some sleep because I'm exhausted. I've been doing all this editing and my brain zapped. And I get into bed and... I've made a rule, no editing past like eight o'clock at night, like after dinner, I'm settling down, I'm going to rest and go to sleep. But yeah, so I I get into bed and I drift off and in the dream, like, I don't know how to say it, I'm in the dream and I see Christopher Moltisanti and I'm having a conversation with him. I can't remember what the conversation was about. I can just remember it was him. I can remember it was like, I've just fallen asleep. So this is the first part of the dream, which is weird because it's really vivid. It's really lucid, like this dream. And I'm talking to him and then suddenly his face turns dark. Like, I don't know how to describe it other than it was Christopher Moltisanti. I still believe it is Christopher Moltisanti, but now he doesn't seem like him. He seems like this malevolent sort of being. I don't know how else to describe it than just horrible looking and like evil. And he grabs me by the throat and pushes me to the ground. And this is the part, like, I didn't think you used to be able to feel pain in dreams, but the thing that's got me so scared and terrified of going to sleep is that I feel this pain. He grabs me by the throat and he starts smashing my head in on the floor. He starts smashing my head into the floor. And the thing is, in the dream, I can feel every single smash and it hurts so much. Like, it My head feels like it's exploding on the ground, like every single time. And I, over the last few weeks, I've realized every time I go into it, for a while it was, I'd fly into the air and smash my head into the ground or I'd, there are so many ways it's happened, I can't explain, but like I've never had it so much. Usually it's once or twice and I wake up. But last night, the night before it was just again and again and again and again. And it was just like this hand around my throat not being able to breathe just constantly getting smashed and I was telling Vic about it the other day and he said try and say something while it's happening or something like that so I thought what the heck and it's weird because I can think while it's happening like it's not me having a dream of it happening it's like me physically being in the dream and this is happening to me and I feel every bit of it like if it was happening to me right now Like, I don't know how to describe it other than that. Like, I know I'm dreaming. I can feel my body not be able to move. And then I feel this happening to me. And I managed to say, like, in the dream, get away from me. Like, I yelled, get away from me. And it was like I was sucked back out the dream, like, really quickly. And I was suddenly awake. I don't know how to describe it. Like, so that it was like I was sucked through something and back up. I don't know how, uh, I don't know if I'm doing a great job at describing this, but yeah, that's what is going on at the moment. And all I can say is it's like hard to convey, but this keeps happening and happening and happening every time I try and fall asleep. And it's like last night, I just, I couldn't bring myself to fall asleep. Like I fell asleep for like a little bit and then I, I just had to wake back up. Like I got about 30 minutes to an hour sleep last night and I don't know, it's just, it's stressful because I like sleep. It's like, I need sleep and yeah, I'm going to go see a doctor, but it's, it's one of those things where it's, you know, when something really impacts you, but because it's not necessarily your health or like you, you know, like I'm going to survive. It's not actually injuring me, you know, maybe mentally, but you know, if I go to the doctor, it's not a life or death situation. It's not something like, you know, uh, an illness that's going to do long term. I don't know what I'm saying. Maybe it is. I don't know. All I know is it's one of those things where you go to the doctor and they're probably just going to tell you, you know, you're stressed or, you know, you maybe you're anxious or you're this or that. I don't know. But yeah, I thought I'd just update everybody with a video of me telling you that. I'm really sorry. I feel like 
I give a lot of myself on these vlogs. Like I let people into my life and I feel like it's a lot easier for me to just say what I'm thinking as opposed to when someone's actually sitting across from me saying what's on my mind and what's up. And I know, I feel like it's a good way for me to talk about things that I can't normally talk about. You know, it's not something, it, it makes me sound crazy in a way, you know, that, that sort of thing. And that, that, that's what's really annoying about it is that, you know, I'm saying all these words, I know it's a dream. I know it's in my head. I know it's this. I don't actually think that I was attacked by Christopher Moltisanti the other night. This is actually called Street View. And it's made by, the video was put together by this person called Rupert Vandervel. And, or Vandervel. He has basically created this, what I think is a small little compilation, 12 minutes long, of the 10 greatest street pictures of all time in his point of view. And I figure that's going to be quite interesting because, you know... Let's see what people think is their greatest street photos. I'm, I might pick something completely different than this guy does. Hello, I'm Rupert Vandervel, oh. and today on the channel we're going to be looking at some of the greatest street photography pictures of all time. I was thinking, not only what is it about them that I like, but why do they stand out? The common ground is that they're all from recognised street photographers, and I think they all have some real significance to the genre. Whether that's because of the subject matter, the style, the technique, or a combination of all these things. There are all images which I think have something really special about them. And hopefully there'll be some surprises there too. Now this is my list and these are pictures that mean something to me. And of course they may not mean that much to you. Of course selecting just 10 pictures in a list like this is extremely difficult. But it's not necessary to list every great picture. In I get that completely. <laughs> like can you imagine? Like, just looking at his wall and the photos and the photo books here, the amount of photos he must look at and see. Like, even me, I I personally can't think of my top ten off the top of my head, but if you put me down, it would probably be, like, Henry Cartier-Bresson, like, a few of his pictures, definitely. There's another guy that uses Leica in black and white. I'm so bad with names. Like, I know a lot of photographers. Uh, I, I used to, like avidly look at street photos a lot is why I started doing it but I can never remember their names anyway in the world to learn what makes a great one well, let's I hope this video is going to generate lots of opinion and feedback so do let me know what you can process where a color transparency is enlarged directly onto reversal color paper for its saturated colors and deep blacks which he found more sensual as we can see in this picture. Dry art believe that a photograph properly exists when printing gives it form something I wholeheartedly agree with. There is a weight and an edginess present here partly it's the color oh that produces. Anyway this I love, I... 1988, this is the thing with it, is that I really, I don't know, it's just, I love this, it's such a good photo, like look at this guy here, so that's a guy right, it's just this little detail here, it's like he looks like a spectre of some kind, you know, it's just so barren, everything's shut, but then it's like the bright colors bouncing off this. It's like, I'm guessing, at first I thought this was snow. I thought this was like Eastern Europe or something like that. Because you can see what looks like a Lada car in there. But it's just this whole, I don't know. Is the right word a juxtaposition? I don't know if that's the right word. I want to sound smart, so I'm hoping it is. But, you know, where it's like this grey, brown ground, barrenness, nothingness. This guy here looks kind of dreary or scary or a bit sinister. And this stray dog just walking off. It's sort of like wild and, you know, all that. But then they have these crazy colourful roofs on all of this with these rainbow colours. But everything's shut and it looks abandoned. And this is... This really makes me want to travel. <laughs> I'm not going to lie with my camera. I've seen so many videos over the past few weeks where people have been traveling and taking photos. And, you know, you couldn't find anything like this in Brighton. 
it's just I love photos like this where you can constantly look and pick out little details like you can see this sort of in the background huh uses this, but it's also the time of day and the position of key elements. The hooded mm. figure, the dog, the front of the car. With the bright colours swing round about and market stalls, you can imagine this place to be one of bustling activity at another time of day. But here there is an air of tension, like something is about to happen, almost like something is about to get out of control. I can see that. It's like, great framing. Like sort of Wild West, like you know? Like that sort of like, I don't know why the dog walking past reminds me of one of the coyotes, you know, in the Wild West that would go past as like the tumbleweed walls by. And then you've got like the, the gunslinger figure here, but it's it's not quite that. But it does give me that air of tension, like something is about to happen. But it's so quiet at the same time. It's such a quiet photo. Like it, this is, I can see why this made the list. This is freaking brilliant. Who is this? Henry... Harry Gry Gryert. I have to look him up. The vertical pole draws our attention to the motionless figure. And I love the multiple layering too. There is great depth to this image. Next up at number nine is... Street photography is the genre that has just about everything. Beauty, drama, excitement, humour, and sometimes the really bizarre. So even though my own pictures aren't really influenced by the more comical and curious side of life, I do take great pleasure in seeing what those who can find it do with it. This, this picture from Melanie Einzig, taken in New York in 2000. Oh wow. Imagine coming across this. Like I, I've been out in the street sometimes and I'll be doing my walk around for street photos and this is the thing that no one, I think, sees, even in my vlogs, because I try not to show it. But there is so much walking and nothing being there. You can take, like, a thousand photos of everything you come across, like, that door and stuff. But having done a lot of street photography, I realize that, you know, all you're doing is wasting your battery and your time. Unless you see something that really strikes out at you. But then there's these other types of photos, like in street photography, you can you can try and tell a scene by like finding an angle and a person standing in a certain way to try and tell a story. Or you can come across an event and the events or like, I don't know how to describe them. They're like when something happens that you get to take a photo of, as opposed to you trying to make a photo out of nothing happening. And this is one of them. It's like, look how much is going on here. You've got this dog. I think it's like a Rottweiler. Looking back, you've got this guy who appears to be zombie-like on... I don't like to assume, but he looks like he's taken something. You've got this couple here, husband and wife. Maybe brothers, they look husband and wife-ish. Girlfriend, boyfriend-ish. Giving each other this hug. You've got this guy with this parrot. It's just like everything about it, but everyone's so close. It's like he starts. How do how do I do this? Sorry, I'm new to reacting, so give me a little bit of leeway here. But you got this fella, yeah. It's sort of like everything's happening. He's he's framed this. Oh, I mean, what am I saying? He, she. I believe a Melanie is a she name. She has framed this. So well. Imagine just like, I'm assuming these people would, maybe not him, but that dog, them, they would be in that perfect bit of embrace maybe quickly. Maybe they're staying there for a while. I don't know, but I don't feel like that opportunity is going to be there for a while. You've got this person with this parrot on. The way their legs are apart, they look like they're walking pretty fast like, in a general direction, probably to get across this road. You know, I always find this is why when I'm out doing street photography, I have my settings always 
like when my ISO set to auto just because you know, I don't need to faff around with it. I don't worry. I don't really care when I'm doing black and white street photography about the noise. But for someone to, you know, capture something like this, you've got to be quick. And you'll find sometimes I'll capture an event. Like, and I call them event photos, by the way. I don't know if this is an actual term, but, you know, when something's happening in a photo, like, where something's happening in the world, you've got to be quick. You've got to be like... Pch-ch-ch. A lot of the times, that's what I managed to do. I just managed to lift up the camera and click, and then I've got the photo. I've never actually managed to capture, you know, um, and, well, what am I saying? I've never, of course I've managed to, but it's, it's hard to get good framing whilst also capturing multiple people doing multiple things at once in front of you at their perfect moment. That's like, you'll be lightning fast, especially, I think this is film. And yeah, that makes it even tougher. You know, I use a mirrorless camera. I can see how my photo is going to turn out because it's got a little TV screen on it, a little, little LCD little screen. And it shows me how exposed my photo is. I can see the end product before I take the photo. You take a photo on film, you know, I mean, you might have a electronic SLR, but, you know, you still, unless you're using automatic settings, got to look in and be like, oh, I've walked a little bit. And like, trust me, if you've ever held like a meter and you're testing light, walking a, a few steps in a certain direction and your light completely changes and suddenly your settings need to change. And it's like, you know, that takes some serious skill. And she's she's nailed this. Let's see what he Thousand. says about it. Nicely sums up the sometimes odd nature of the streets, with this gathering of six characters on a street corner. A dog, a hugging couple, a man who looks like he might not make it out of the frame, a parrot and its owner. It's quite an ensemble. Einzig came across this scene on the way to work one day, but she was clearly alert to the situation, and that's a lesson to learn from. You never know what's going to be waiting around the next corner. Mm. Let's move on to number eight in the list. It's actually quite funny. I'll skip this ad. It's Tori it's Robbins, listen, funny. I'm oh, driving the studio right now. Oh, I hate I these ads so much. Don't... Ah! Stop, out. Stop trying to one... sell me stuff. So, I say as I put ads on my videos, but yeah. So, it's funny hearing this guy talk about stuff and giving the same sort of... Uh, <laughs> saying the same things that I am. I, I don't know if I'm going to... This is going to be a hell of a long video if I don't stop talking a lot. Okay. But yeah, it's quite it's quite. Magnum photographer Trent the Park has me. said that it's not enough for him to just go out... Or say similar things to me, I should... ...on the streets and shoot people. He needs to be trying to push the oh medium of photography as well. Well, that's a message for all of us, I would say. And the picture I have chosen of his is a good example of why. In this image, from his dream... Wow. Oh my word. You know, I don't honestly often say this, but I don't, I'm trying to think how he's done that. How? Hold on, bro. How? Because you, first I was thinking maybe he's, he's put an ND filter on it because like you can get this effect from water by turning your shutter speed right down. And yeah. How? I... That's incredible. Look at this figure, just everything about this.
Anyway, Dream Life City. Trent Park. Is. It looks like a city dweller has suddenly been transported to the Amazon rainforest. Seriously? It's a fantastic use of the misty morning Sydney light, whether the effect is natural or not. The hint of city building is a nice intrusion on this otherwise dreamlike event. Ah, I like how he's put that. So, yeah, he is saying he doesn't know the effect. Like, I, I, I didn't think about that, actually, because I'm too busy thinking about how you do this in camera. You could do this outside the camera but that doesn't really matter this is just like you have to catch this photo to be able to bring out the effect anyway i mean like this is pretty damn like damn black and white is the right format here as we focus tonally as well as from the subject itself a worthy inclusion in the top 10 list time to move on and look at number seven in the list that's how is that so high up do these go in order of his favourite? Like, oh. Alex Webb is a photographer whose work I absolutely love. His pictures are often vibrant and complex and very different to my own style. There is so much we can learn by the coloured light catching... Okay, I don't want to show this dude's whole video. ...ashes of culture. Skip to the photos. Well, this picture is right up my street. The last... Oh, wow. I love how they frame this so small. I like it. Sometimes I'll do it on the seafront is, you know, instead of just getting a silhouette and putting it as like a big, you know, silhouette in front of the sea, I'll make the silhouette tiny. So there's massive amounts of negative space, but this is like the opposite. They've filled in the space, but they've... The silhouette of those two, two guys down there is so crisp. Like it looks like, it looks like an abstract painting that you'd have on your wall. I don't know if anyone else agrees with me, but whew, imagine like walking past this, because you got to remember it. Unless I'm wrong and. There was some weird effect going on this day. He, That's not how your eye would have picked it up. Your eye would have picked up the sun bouncing on those guys. You would have seen the light going up through the middle of the staircase because that's where it would have gone. You would have seen them through there. There's like this thing where when I look around, and I know other people that do this, is you you are taking so many photos, you almost learn with your eyes what the photo will look like before you take it so you can see photos like this. But the amount of creativity in your mind you need to have to put this together is just, it's really remarkable. Like, I actually, I don't know any of the people that we've seen so far. This is the first time I've ever heard of these people. And I'm I'm so glad I clicked on this video. Large areas of shadow decorated by the coloured light catching okay. parts of the structure dominate the composition, but draw our attention to the two figures in close conversation in the area below. The lines of shadow in the space in front of them echo the patterns of corrugated roofing on each side above. The semi-abstract nature of this image is all in the shape, light and silhouettes of the characters, who are a fine example of the human form within the urban environment. The shapes of coloured light add a delicate but definite vibrancy to the scene. It's amazing how so... I wish I was able to describe things like... Uh, well, I've forgotten his name now. Like the, this fella in the video that I'm watching. <laughs> I should remember his name. I'm so bad with names. He is such like a delicate way of describing everything. Like, it's so sophisticated and... Yeah. <coughs> Sensational. Little of something can add so much. I've talked about this. Okay, I want to move up because I don't want to show his video. Like, oh, Joel Melwitz. This was one of the guys I was talking about earlier. I know Joel Melwitz. Okay. Anyone familiar with my work will know that I'm not particularly a fan of crowded street scenes because it ticks that box with added drama and humor. 
Yeah, see, I I think with a crowded street scene, you can just shoot into the street and get lucky. Like, it's not, it's not... I don't know, I like empty scenes. He's actually got a point, like, when when you shoot across a lot of things happening, you can, you can take a... There's a thing with street photography where you can take a photo of a street and people on it, and I find a lot of people when I look at Instagram and I don't want to speak badly about people's work but they'll take a photo of someone walking down the street and then they'll put it into Lightroom and what they'll end up doing is they'll just put a preset on it and then they pull it out and there's a street photo and I think for me street photography like it it has to have a meaning behind it I feel it doesn't have to but for me to enjoy it, in my opinion, I need to... There's something about it that needs to tell a story or something or convey an emotion or something as opposed to just capturing someone walking down the street. I feel like those are photos where, you know, I'll do them, but it's to get my confidence up to take the photo that I want to take or to practice taking the photos. And, you know, it's good for building confidence. Looking at this, I like Joel Merowitz. I like this uh, leopard in the window sort of look. It's not my favourite one out of everything. I see there's a lot going on in here. It's definitely not what I was saying before, by the way. That's not what I'm saying at all. Like one of those. I was just pointing out what our friend was saying before. And, yeah, I see a lot going on in here. But there's nothing major. I don't know. Let's listen to what he has to say, actually. He might change my mind. Taken on Fifth Avenue in New York City in 1975, it's a brilliant use of light and available props. Working an object like this stuffed tiger in a shop window into an everyday street scene is about as creative as it gets. A real dichotomy, but the way the colours of the tiger's fur and those of the coats of the passers-by connect is wonderful. The woman wearing the headscarf even has a fur collar. It comes together beautifully. Great framing too, with the man and woman entering the scene from the left, helping to balance things out. See, that's the thing with this, is he's coming at it from quite a technical place. Whereas, I don't know if I'm as technical with the light and stuff. I, I know, I'm not saying it's a bad photo. Not in any way, don't get me wrong, it's a lovely photo. It's just, for me, it wouldn't be on the list. I've seen a lot of Joel Merowitz's work, and there are tons of photos that he's taken that I love more than that. And it's not saying that I don't like it, it's just 10 greatest street pictures of all time. For me, that isn't one of them. And that goes to show, like, it's how how someone's art can be subjective, you know? You know, someone may love something and someone may totally not. And especially in photography, you get a lot of different opinions. People like things for different reasons and... Yeah, it's it's another thing is that one of your best photos, in your opinion, someone else may have a totally different opinion on what one of your best photos is than someone else. It's it, I've noticed it a lot in selling my photography through Darkroom is, and that, yeah, that's a little plug for my Darkroom. I'll drop the link above. But is that i i was i'm selling photos that i wasn't expecting to sell and i'm selling less of the photos that i thought would sell a lot more and yeah it's this why photography is so interesting is because people can have totally different takes on the same photo and people can have wildly different reasons why they like photos now entering the top five anyway let's not oh look there we go we're back to... Oh, no, I thought it was going to be another... These little chapters down here are quite misleading. But anyway. Oh, I like this. Look at that. That's great framing, in my opinion. 
he's gone like the different lanes on each of these like squares so he's made each each floor is like its own lane and then he's got these people down below the colors as well the fact that all these taxis have like these linking color palettes Jeez. I wonder, you know, in photos like this, how long he had to stand up where he was to wait for a perfect moment. Did he arrive there and all these cars were in place and look out and just go, oh, that's a good photo? Or did he stand there and think, you know, if I was there, I'd be like looking at what was below me and I'd think, is this as good as it gets? Or do I wait and see whether it can be better? Because you don't know who's going to walk past down here. You've got this guy going along. I love... This is the thing. I love the space. I don't know. There, there's something about photos that have so much going on in such a small space just full of people. Sometimes they can feel a little claustrophobic. And I feel like, for me, maybe it's the, the little bit of perfectionism in me. But they need to perfect out. So, like, a photo that's fully filled but in a straight sort of line would, I don't know. I'm, I don't know how to explain what I'm thinking, but yeah, I love this. It's strange though, because the photos that he had lower down the list, now he's saying he's in his top five. It would be the other way so far for me. Yeah, I see. Which looks down on his normal shooting position. Let's skip. Although much of his work I'm set right. him apart from his contemporaries because of his use of colour film, this shot is almost monochrome with only the brake lights of the car oh confirming my. that it's not. This is a wonderful shot of pedestrians battling against a snowstorm, but the real genius is in the framing. Using the canopy to block out the sky, which would have lessened the impact, helps to draw our attention to the drama below. That's what I mean by, like, empty space. See, this is an incredible photo, in my opinion. I've seen this, like, I've seen this before, this photo, and I remember looking at it back then. You know, it's funny, the last time I think I saw this was right before I went to Canada. Because I was, I was, I was looking through stuff when I was bored and I was trying to gain some inspiration because I really wanted to do some street photography in Canada. And when I got there, there was that snow that day in, in Calgary. I wonder if I subconsciously got inspired by this. I never never used an umbrella I think that is that he's using to frame or one of those things that goes above like a restaurant those umbrellas that come out and cover that's that's so smart yeah, I wonder if like would have held the camera up or is he bringing an umbrella down to like to cover the lens and it's just like the way if you look the tree in here it just goes perfectly up into that gap this must be over the top of a restaurant because it's got one of those things coming down and you sort of look out and you can still make these figures and all these people just struggling in this harsh snow but there it's black oh my god it's incredible hello Twentieth century street photography scene. This picture from 1963. Oh my god. This is there, there, there's this type of photo that I see people do, and it's the sort of thing that I always want to recreate. And it's the reason why I go for timeless looks is because it's those looks where you can't tell where it's taken, so maybe it could have been from a time period where it is like this in the 60s or the 50s or, you know, whenever or the 80s. I love capturing something that looks like a different 
time piece. But it's, the reason I go for them also is because I was inspired by photos that look like this. I've never seen this before, but my God. Look, you can sort of make out that this is like one of those grand buildings with those Roman style columns. Like maybe a courthouse or something. And this guy looks like a sailor. He's carrying a sack of something like potatoes, I'm guessing, or something like that. Not sure. But just like the use of the shadow on the face, even. And then just how well you can see the ground, even his reflection. That's just something else. really inspires me to do photography <laughs> to be honest but I feel like sometimes I think I'd never be able to capture something like this in Brighton it's just not grand enough you know it's it's quite a small city there's just not enough going on there's not enough places but then isn't that part of it is that that's the real challenge isn't it I'm sure he he didn't go out and capture this magnificent fine piece of work just because he, where he was at he did it because he's that good that he can do something like this. It's just incredible. Like, you can make more of it out, more of it out the more you look into the shadow as well. That's crazy. William Klein. Uh, now, well. street portraiture, this full on, isn't something I would ever consider doing. Oh, I know. Portrait of a young boy. Whoa. Okay, so street portraits. I really like street portraits. I've always liked doing street portraits. But in order to get a street portrait, you're getting so close you're at the point where you've just got to ask them for permission right or you just gotta let them they're they're gonna know you're taking a photo of them i mean there, there is this technique where people say where you can get that close to someone and take a photo of them unbeknownst them i've done it because people don't assume you're taking a photo of them when you get that close because it's just not something that someone sane would do go into someone they don't know his face and take a photo but then you get circumstances where you know you know you can take the photo. And the, this, is, of course, is one of them because he's interacting with the camera. But that's that's such a good photo. <laughs> Look at the face. The gun. Hoping it's a toy gun. But yeah, that, that takes some balls. I guess it's from, it's from a time where, I guess, it, it may not have been the same. I mean, if you go up to a child now and get right in their face and take a photo of them, you're asking for trouble. But this is probably from a time when, you know, cameras meant something else in 1954. It probably wasn't, you know, you didn't have camera phones and it wasn't a way. I don't know. I'm talking about 1954 like I lived in it. But that's like, all, this is the sort of photo that I always try to sort of go for when I go out if I take street portraits. Of course, I don't come near, but, like, like if you've ever seen the photo that I took of the guy eating fish and chips on the seafront, that's, this is where it's come from. I know William Klein is, like I said, I'm bad with names, but I've seen his work before. This is probably the sort of work that most heavily influences mine for like 100% certainty. There's a few on this list that have had heavy influences, whether I know it or not, but if there was anyone and any sort of photo that you'd get that is iconic and that has influenced me, it'd be this for sure. On the upper Broadway in New York. This is why pointing I, a gun directly. I've always wanted to do street photography in New York. Oh my god. That would be an actual dream to go to New York and do street photography. I mean I know it's not like this anymore, but there's just something about photos taken in New York. They have that extra character in them. Get into his camera is priceless. The expression on the 
final image in my top 10 list of favourite street pictures. Oh, it's got to be. Of course, there has to be a Cartier-Bresson picture in my top 10 list of favourite street pictures, and it's no real surprise to find it at number one. The tricky question for me was which one was it going to be? I've made a video looking at one of his early images taken in Spain, which you can find on the channel. And today in the top 10 list... Let's just look at that. Like... I mean, Henry Cartier-Bresson was just... I don't think, I think in my opinion, he is the best of the best. And I mean, look at the date it was taken in 1933. I mean, like thinking back and thinking about it, like, can you imagine the camera that he would have had to have to take photos back then? If you've ever seen what cameras looked like in 1933 and how they worked, it's pretty, mu like, incredible, like, what he does. I can't imagine some of the photos that I've had to take that I'm most proud of. I was only able to take because my camera was so easy to set to where I wanted it to be. So I was sure I was exposing it right. Like, just the idea of having to walk around with, like, taking light readings and then moving fast enough to get the images that he takes. I said this on like an interview in the past was that it's just incredible. Like the, the time in which he took these photos and just how they're like timeless in the opposite way. You look back at some of his photos and you could be like, that could have been done by a street photographer today, but it was done by someone in 1920, some of them, 1930. It's just like, he took photos in the war. Like, you know, you know, if street photography's in a world war, street photos in a world war, it's just, he's, in, he's, he's the greatest of all time, in my opinion. I've talked for so long during this video I've never done a reaction before. I don't know if you want to see another one. <laughs> but I'll try and make it shorter next time, I think. Because I don't know how long this is, but I think this might be the longest video I've ever made. Anyway, if you've liked today's video, please drop a like on the video. If you're not subscribed, I'd appreciate it if you did. If you want to. Uh, I'm going to put a link to my darkroom shop up above. If you'd like any of the photos on there, please make a purchase. And I think this video will come out tomorrow, which is the 26th. So if you're watching this, then the night that you're watching this on, well, the day, I'm going to do it at night. Yeah, so on the night of the, vi on the night of the day that you're watching this on, the new photo of a certain someone should be on the shop. And I think it's a good photo this week. So don't miss it. And yeah, thank you so much for watching. Have a lovely evening. Thank you. Oh yeah, and if you have anything that you'd like me to react to, and no promises, but I'll have a look through. And if there's something that I think is good, Maybe I'll react to it next time. Bye. Also, I forgot to say, and I want to do this more for anything that I do on this. Please go and check out this video. I'm going to drop a link in the description. I'm going to try and put one above to this video. Top 10 greatest street pictures of all time. Street view with Rupert Van Der Velle. Please go and drop him a like. I'm doing it now. And if you like his stuff, subscribe to him. I don't want to use his video in mine and not give him like due credits and direct people to where they can actually watch the video because I don't want to take any potential. I mean, you know, I don't want to use his work and not direct people there. So, yeah, I've got to add that in. Anyway, bye.